and uh, we know uh, from the uh, you know the nerulu times uh, a couple of years back we did something called as nerulu a tree festival uh, in bangalore some of our good friends natural uh, loving uh, friends started that uh, uh, festival and um, uh, so before uh, i think again i'm i'm kind of losing myself i don't want to play i'll try and play if i can play that particular video about talam quickly i'll play this if it is uh, a one minute video about talam Pretty much, Talam. Uh, so let's move on to introducing uh, Rajiv. Uh, like I said, I always thought Rajiv as a, a naturalist and things like that, but I get to know only through this event. He's a dentist, right? A, a trained public health uh, dentist uh, from Bangalore. He's born and brought up in Bangalore. Uh, so his interest in medicinal plants started when he started working with the Adivasis in Gudulur uh, in Greece. I get to know him. Uh, through the nerulu again the tree connection that we have it is very interesting very nice personality to know and uh, to be with right uh, so uh, his anthroponical approach to understanding oral health among the adivasis is the first thing that he kind of started when uh, you know approached the medicinal plants related to adivasis and this community led project uh, the documentation involving adivasi youth specific to their uh, uh you know the medicinal values medicinal plant usages led into a book it's a bilingual book uh, it's an amazing book to see i shared he shared uh, uh, some of the pages from uh, the soft copy the book is yet to release but we are thinking this is more like a soft launch of the book though i put it in the poster saying launching uh, the book it is more like a soft launch of the book uh, so it's it's published in uh, tamil and english and it's more of a field guide book for anybody to refer to if at all if you're looking at these medicinal plants which uh, are stuck with these adivasis and it's more important for us also to know and then use it for the future right so over to you uh, rajiv thanks for accepting to do this for talam talks yeah thank you pv uh, so yeah so uh, without much um, delay i'll start off uh, thanks once again for uh, having me here on this platform it means a lot and this is the first time i have ever spoken about this um, on this work uh, so uh, so beginning with um, you can see on the screen uh, i've shared uh, the book is called pachamarundu pachamarundu the title pachamarundu so pachamarundu means herbal medicine uh, in the adivasi language and uh, since they use it this term so we thought that this would be befitting to put that as a title and that's why this is and a little bit about uh, pachamarundu or uh, herbal medicine so it's not something very new to us it's been ubiquitous and it's universal across the world and such local health traditions or folk medicine uh, traditions have been there across the world for centuries and that's how humans have evolved uh, with the advent of medicine using such folk traditions 
And the very uh, unique characteristic about these are that it is passed from one generation to the other through oral traditions without much uh, anything written in text. And this is how it's differentiated from classical health systems such as Ayurveda, Saurikpa in Tibet, or Hunani uh, or Arabic medicine from Middle East and Persia, or uh, Siddha from Tamil Nadu. Uh, so, so such folk traditions of what we know in our own household practices, like what grandmother's medicine or kitchen medicine. So this is um, and uh, um, yeah. So this is this is about the folk traditions and how such local health traditions contribute to our uh, health in in a day to day life. So how it started was uh, when I, in 2015, I was a community health learning fellow in a uh, health-based organization in Bangalore called uh, Society for Community Health Action and Research Awareness. And as part of the fellowship, I chose to go to Gurlur, uh, which is in the Nilgiris district of Tamil Nadu uh, state for doing my field work. So in this uh, play, in Gurlur, there is a organization called Accord, which has been working for last 30 years with the indigenous communities better known as Adivasis in India, and uh, on, on a lot of issues, and health has been one of their forefront uh, work. And their community health approach to deal uh, primary health care has been one of the success stories in India. And uh, so I went to study that. And while I was there, I uh, observed that the Adivasis have been using uh, herbal medicine uh, along with the Western biomedicine. But also during an initial community immersion, uh, I, I started wondering what do they do for their oral health? And suppose a person gets a toothache in a remote village which has not much access to road or uh, dentist. And, and this, this inquiry process led me to formally inquire this using anthropological uh, tools such as ethnography, understanding how oral health is perceived or addressed among the Adivasi community. And this led me to uh, dive into uh, the Adivasi community. So I started uh, meeting a lot of healers, uh, elders, children, school teachers, and many other community members, non-Adivasi uh, people are like dentists, doctors as well. And so during this, uh, so even going before that, I'll just give a very brief uh, introduction about the Adivasis uh, in this uh, region. So there are totally about 20,000 people, estimated 20,000 population in the Gudlur and the Pandalur Taluks. And Gudlur is in a very unique geographical position. It's at the tri-junction of Karnataka state, Kerala state, and Tamil Nadu state. So, so it's, it's a meeting place of the three states. And the topography, geography, the cultural characteristics are quite unique. And you know it's very much mixed cultures. So among the 20,000 populations, the largest is the Panya community, which is about 57% followed by Beta Kurumba, which is 21%, and followed by Katunaika, and then Mulukurumba, and a very small size of Irula population. So the Panya, the largest being the Panya, they have been uh, working as bonded laborers for centuries, but now they still, a lot of them work in the tea plantations as man uh, laborers. Uh, the Beta Kurumba is known for their uh, elephant training uh, techniques, and so most of them are being employed by the forest department. The Kartanaikas, so this picture is from uh, one of the Kartanaika village. This is, uh, this is one of their houses, uh, very beautiful, very, very neat looking. Kartanaika itself literally means masters of the forest and they're known for their uh, uh, non-timber forest collect, uh, produce, especially honey collecting. So among all the groups, the Mulukurumbas are it's the settled agriculturists. And within the, uh, the Adivasi social hierarchy, they are placed, uh, placed highest. And uh, so while getting back to this uh, ethnography study, I used to meet a lot of healers and talk to them about how oh, they, they see uh, local health traditions or their Pachamarundu is following, what are the challenges? And in one such meeting, so I got to meet this elderly healer, uh, Chemban. So we all call him as Chemban Tata. And I used to meet him quite often. And in one of the conversations, he told that beyond asking these questions, uh, that his his also he told me that that this uh, uh, folk medicine tradition has to be continued, and they should there should be a mechanism where it has to be taught to the Adivasi children, and they also should know about it. And in the same conversation, he also told that that this medicinal knowledge should be preserved, and we have to write down. Otherwise, it will be lost. And if healers do not pass it to their children. So if they die, it will, it will be lost forever. 
And for me, it was very much uh, provoking. Uh, so I, I reflected that with the healer passing away, an entire generation of knowledge is passed. And it's lost unless until if it's there is a good made to conserve it or document it. So this started, this was sort of like a uh, trigger to this project. And, and later, after uh, in 2016, I went back to that organization. I start, I joined there and I was working as a, a team member there. So I started uh, taking his advice and I was working in the same organization school, uh, got an opportunity to work with children. So in one instance, I asked these children to teach me about what they know about uh, their uh, healing um, tradition. And, and in the first exercise in the school campus, which is about two acres plot, uh, all the children surveyed whatever they knew and they we found 57 medicinal species. So like this, we started and then we used to start going to villages which are close to the edge of the forest. And here in the first picture, uh, the picture on the left side, you can see in one of the transit walks near the village, uh, uh, which is close to the forest edge. Uh, so such, such activities started more and more, we got more um, encouragement. And also simultaneously, there's an organization in Bangalore called Foundation for Revitalization of Local Health Traditions, or shortly known as uh, FRLH. And they were also doing a survey about mother and child care among the Adivasis. And they were also collecting a lot of um, uh, documenting uh, medicinal plants. So later in uh, later in 2000, October 2016, I attended a, a, a tribal um, meeting uh, held at in a place called Sargur in Mysore, uh, very close to the, uh, Sargur is again forest area, close to the Kavini forest. Uh, so there was a two-day meeting about the tribal health systems. And here, one of the uh, speaker, uh, who's also a healer, uh, traditional healer from a, a, a Adivasi community living in the other side of the forest, in the, the uh, Nagarole forest, told that a multinational company had come to him, got to know a lot about the herbs. and. Uh, subsequently, I think after two years, he found out that whatever herbs he had mentioned, that they had patented. And he stressed a lot about this commercial exploitation and a lot of stress was on documenting medicinal plants. And the whole of two-day meeting, as you can see here, some of them had got their herbs, put it in the center. There was a lot of dance, songs, and discussion about what is the threat, persistent and immediate threat to this uh, the intellectual property. And at the same time, one colleague called Vino Dethirajan, who was also working in the school uh, in Gurlur, introduced me to this book uh, published by A3 in Bangalore. Uh, this book called Treasures on Tri Tiger Tracks about uh, the Kalakad Mundanturai Tiger Reserve in Tamil Nadu. So this was a bilingual uh, guide about that uh, reserve. And that, and simultaneously, I was already getting some ideas on how to do it. And this book gave me a clear idea of how, how to go about and um, and, and that that gave me an idea. On. So I put this idea with the Adivasi community members and with uh, in the whole of 2017, we had a couple of meetings. And finally, uh, we were able to raise funds uh, from a UK-based organization and we started the work in 2018. And so what we did was not the beginning, but in Accord, already a lot of work had been done. Early 90s, there was a doctor called Dr. Mari Muthu had document, started this work. Uh, uh, Anita Vergis, uh, who also had contributed to this, and she is now the vice president of Keystone Foundation in Kothagiri, who are also working with the Adivasis there. So had started this work, and uh, so there's uh, in Gurlu, there's an estate called Madhuvana Estate where uh, Accord had started a nursery for medicinal plants and indigenous plants there. And in 2012, uh, they were also involved in something called Kau Survey. Kau is a sacred group which is found across Western Ghats, starting from the southern Maharashtra, Ratnagiri, Sindhudurg, Goa, Karnataka, Kerala. So Kau is a sacred group uh, where uh, the, the trees are worshipped by the local people. And this gives a very unique perspective to uh, the relation, the religious connection to the humans and the plant world. And we also, uh, so there was a survey conducted and they found 45 species that are revered. And again, in 2015, the earlier survey that I mentioned, uh, also had documented these species. So then we collected all of these, started our work with combining all of these and uh, eliminating duplicates and then working, taking it forward. So our team mainly consisted of myself and three other Adivasi youth. So mainly it was with Subin, 
who had just finished his MA in development from Azim Prem University. And he had three months of time before he started his work at Foundation for Ecological Security and uh, in Guwahati. And so he joined us and we started working on this. So we also had a, a high school, uh, a freshly finished high school uh, graduate, Vishnu, who was also from the Adivasi community. And he, so three of us would go uh, do a lot of work. We occasionally had Satish also who would join us and help us with uh, the same. So our field work mainly consisted of visiting a lot of healers, asking if them uh, they would be interested in uh, sharing their knowledge. So we would go, uh, we would take audio records, uh, audio record, whatever they say, take field notes, write down, or sometimes video record. Along with our cameras, we would also photo document. So we would meet uh, elderly healers across the villages. And we would also take books along with us and show them the plants and if they could identify and say, give the Adivasi names, what they know about it. So for example, this is a, a short, I, I always had the habit of having these small uh, pocket notebooks. And uh, my way of working was like scribble down notes, uh, uh, like take down rough diagrams of how it looked like. And uh, since I know how to read and write Kannada, I would... Uh, write uh, write down the proper pronunciation of the adivasi names in in canada and then go back and you know enter it in uh, in an excel sheet later so our field work took to a lot of areas unseen areas paddy fields uh, forest edges um, tea plantations sometimes we would also take uh, from the frht survey uh, we identified these species we would take the photos from google show it to the healers ask them the adivasi names so we did a lot of uh, juggling and there was no one particular way of documenting it. So here again, uh, elderly Panya uh, women healer, uh, we walked with her for nearly seven to eight kilometers in the Madhuvana TA estate. Uh, she knew so much on her fingertips. Every every plant she knew had, uh, had a medicinal value. Uh, here is um, Geetama, who is a, a Peta Kurumba elderly healer. She and her... Uh, grandson knew so much about uh, a nine-year-old grandson also knew so much who, who also took us around and showed a lot of us so sometimes our field work not not only involved just talk, talking to them but also digging ourselves for tubers to identify clicking pictures um, so this i want to show this picture this is again in the uh, in the madhuvana tsa close to the kerala border this was taken by subin from a high point this just to show that the magnanimity of the forest uh, and, and the amount of treasure that it holds. And here I am there with um, uh, Satish and uh, with the elderly Panya women healer. So uh, uh, this was also the day we encountered uh, elephant herd. And, and so our field work was not just simply uh, knowing more about medicinal plants, but also sometimes quite adventurous, like um, escaping our, uh, um, uh, escaping <laughs> from the elephants and wildlife. So we would also come and every day put it into an Excel sheet. And this was told to us, uh, guided us to us by Siddharth Machado, who is who was at uh, National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, um, who is now at University of South Florida doing his PhD. He gave us a lot of practical tips on how to do our daily work, uh, simple things like uh, Excel sheet, cataloging. It was very handy, very, very helpful. So every day we would come, uh, have the Excel sheet spread, the better uh, the each individual uh, Adivasi names and what it is used for. And this list went on growing every day as we uh, progressed in our field work. So totally, we were able to reach as much as healers as possible. Our aim was to reach at least cover all the four Adivasi communities. So I think we could manage as much as possible. And uh, in the course, we met so many healers and uh, visited a lot of places. And uh, this this particular picture where Ketan, uh, a better Kurumba healer, uh, had taken us, and this paddy field was sort of like, uh, for me personally, uh, a very tipping point with my earlier anthropological research, which I'll share it a little later. So uh, totally, our, uh, the earlier archival work had identified 205 species. We additionally added 52 species from our field work. So totally 257 were discovered. But we were able to only photo document only 123, and we still don't know. Uh, we only the, know the names, but we don't. We couldn't identify 134 species. For, uh, so, so there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. So, in the field work, 
apart from just documenting i learned a lot from an anthropological perspective uh, connecting to my earlier research so in the folk traditions you know prayers and rituals are given a lot of prominence so this particular picture on the left side what you see is is a small shrine next to this uh, elderly kartanayaka healer uh, house and next to it is a small sacred group so when we approach her so she went into the shrine she offered prayers and then came back and uh, gave us uh, shared a lot of information so the healing tradition is very much intricately uh, faith based so they also value the source where to source the uh, herbs from what time of the day or what uh, day of the week or which season so so it's very much um, uh, this knowledge is orally transferred from one generation to another and and the training begins as early as 4 or 5 years sometimes and it's a lot of learning by seeing and doing and which is very much you know um, uh, culturally intangible source and also we started practicing what we learned for example there's a picture of uh, subin's feet so our our field work was during peak monsoons and as you know in western ghats uh, one of the biggest pro- not a problem but uh, sort of like an issue is like leech so uh, we were also prepared for it and so subin's idea of warding of le- leeches were uh, using these tropical soda apple or what is locally known as um, ana sunde uh, ana sunde kai dud sunde kai in kannada and ana chunda in uh, tamil so pick up these ripe fruits which are just growing along the road side uh, crush them apply those juice on the feet and just keep walking and you know leeches won't stuck uh, get stuck to your feet because it has a lot of salt content and as we walk and you know it gets washed away again pick some more fruits uh, wash it repeat it so it was also very uh, environmentally sustainable way of uh, working with the nature and also i i sought treatment for my lower back ache from one of the elderly healer and luckily it worked out so uh, this is one of the perks of the field work but this was a tipping point so chemin tata who had earlier told about who provoked to do this work also had told me how he treats a toothache when somebody comes to him with toothache so he told me in his own words that uh, there is this wonder herb which miraculously reduces toothache and and i i sort of somehow couldn't believe it something like this but we also met many uh, a couple of uh, times later but i never got a chance to discuss about this herb but before we started our field work in 2018 and i had first met him in late 2015 he unfortunately passed away and i could not get a chance to interact with him and know more about this herb but later in the earlier sh- uh, picture in the uh, while walking in the paddy field uh, with ketan uh, so he told me that he pointed out this herb and said i should be knowing about this and i said i don't know and he said this is what we call falluvali chedi which means literally means to take plant so this is and this ring bell to what earlier chamban tata had told me and went back to refer to the notes that he had told and sent pictures of this to uh, the botanist in bangalore and they identified this as uh, acmella oleraceae this is also interesting because um, this uh, same time i was also introduced through sochara to one cambridge uh, an anthropologist at cambridge university uh, who told me about one of his professor who was doing similar work and then he connected me to his professor uh, uh, professor francois babira feedman uh who in her phd research in peruvian amazon was treated for her toothache by the healers there with this plant so she spent the next 35 to 40 years working on this plant and then we connected and she told how this is actually a south american origin plant has now been naturalized across the world and it came to india by the dutch uh, dutch and the portuguese and and then i real uh, i reached a saturation point in my uh, oral health anthropology and i finished my 3 year 3 and a half year research and i started writing spent the next one and a half year writing about this research and recently we we submitted to a journal to publish it but but our ethno ethnobotanical documentation continued so there were so many such discoveries as part of this field work and in summary so how it started is we would go to the healers audio record take notes then come back immediately catalog sort the photos feed the excel sheet and uh, uh, meet uh, and you know exchange our uh, knowledge with the botanists in bangalore um, like siddharth machado from ncbs navindu page from uh, tata institute or iisc arun kumar uh, again who was then at forest research institute in dehradun 
and couple of others and they 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 voluntarily they helped us a lot uh, in, in uh, identifying the scientific names then sometimes we didn't have a lot of information so we revisited with the healers and then finally all of this information was edited and put in a word document and finalized and then translated uh, uh, translation was done by uh, one of our colleague at uh, gudlur uh, durga and then all of this information was taken to designer uh, and 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 there were a lot of iterations so nearly six uh, six iterations happened back and forth corrections and our designer was so much patient uh, and helped us so much uh, bringing out this wonderful uh, book very uh, simple in information crisp a lot of pictures so right now we are at the stage of printing so accord in gullur is now taking a call on how to go about it and how we can so the next step would be to register this book with the tamil nadu state biodiversity board to uh, ensure uh, um, safeguard the intellectual property rights and especially against the commercial exploitation mainly pink tinting and finally our idea original idea was to print these books and give back to the adivasi youth or whoever is interested and therefore continue this chain of uh, uh, knowledge transfer so a little sneak peek into how our book is looking is so um, the scientific name and the family name above and all that information that we collected from all the four communities are summarized and put in simple english and what what part of the plant or tree is used and um, uh, what is it, what ailment is it used for and then we have the names in all the four uh, adivasi uh, languages beta kurumba kartanayaka mulu kurumba paniya followed by the local vernaculars kannada tamil malayalam and english interspersed with pictures and emphasizing on the part of the plant or tree of which it is used for so on the same on the other side of the page uh, we have this same same information translated in tamil and so uh, although so most of the adivasis can read and write um, tamil especially the younger generation so that's why it was decided to put it in tamil uh, although there is no script for the adivasi language uh so it was decided to have it in tamil as well as english english for the non tamil speakers for the benefit of those uh, who cannot read and write tamil uh, for example like me and also we had a lot of illustrations for example the left illustration is by a volunteer from australia called ann best so ann uh, ann doc uh, saw some pictures or sometimes whenever she visited villages recorded these and uh, so here is a illustration of mulu kurumba women going for fishing so this fishing basket is made out of bamboo so it is taken and they would stand in the stream and uh, put this basket down in the stream wait for the fish to come and when the fish comes in and they would put lift it up and take the pick up the fish and put it in this small small basket with a narrow mouth uh, so that's how how intricate the the adivasi uh, life with the uh, uh, plant world is and the illustration on the left side right side is done by my brother sanjeev so this is again uh, uh adult uh, paniya men uh, uh, playing drums and flute during a festival called putteri it's a harvest festival happens around uh, september october i think october november and and the flute is made from the bamboo whereas these small drums are made from a uh, wild jack or locally known as aini and uh, uh, we also were wanted to include um, the uh, not just the adivasi knowledge about the medicinal uses but also about the cultural uses religious uses uh, functional uses first uh, functional uses and sumya so we know from our observations that the adivasi life is so much revolving around the nature and through songs and dance so we also decided to include some of the songs that they have which talks about the plant world and therefore we chose a uh, food four different points from each community and uh, put it in this book so some of the challenges that we faced uh, during the field work is uh, starting with the biggest is ownership of the information and how do we get consensus on agreeing uh, how do we who owns it when we say it's a community knowledge of course it's community knowledge but few people know more than the others and how do we uh, ensure that this knowledge is transferred to the next generation and how do uh, as a whole uh, people from outside of like us also make sure contribute to this uh, transfer so this 
debate of some of them not ready to share it divulge this information was uh, was acknowledge and we couldn't uh, you know help it but respect that uh, decision the next was access to the informants was so difficult as you see the number of healers that we met were very few and these are all old through the pictures you could have you could easily see they're all old some of them couldn't recall the names some of them couldn't uh, identify um, how it looked like they had the clear loss of memory they were if they knew everything they were fragile they couldn't they were not in a physical condition to take us out and uh, show uh, show us these exact plans so this was this shows the dire need to document this as as early as possible the other challenge was documenting it in vernacular names like for example as i said this is in the tri junction area and the villages towards the karnataka side had a influence of kannada and therefore the names would uh, differ from the villages and the names uh, the language spoken towards the kerala border which had a little malayalam influence so for example like a baga tree would sound bagi baga bagi but we had to document as it is told to us and later we also encountered challenges like some others who told that this is not how it is but so this this confusion continued even till last week when we had to finalize this document and the same with the the latin names the scientific names which are pronounced in latin and so far nobody or none of i haven't come across anybody who can speak latin and uh, none of us know how exactly it's pronounced in latin and therefore we could uh, use that pronunciation to translate in tamil so this this confusion was also there and and finally how do we present this information uh, that is easily accessible we have audio recordings we have video and i think although like whatever i have seen the documented so far is mostly in the book form including us but how do we also put up an audio and video which is also equally important to uh, show so so there's no one answer i feel but it's very important that we need to come up with ideas on how do we present it and accessible to everybody so finally i want to end with thanking uh, first of all the adivasi community members the healers especially boman tata and chemban tata who were very much um, uh uh very uh, encouraging in this work and um uh and also i would like to thank um um uh, my dr mahesh matpati who is now who is the technical advisor of this project who is now based at london school of hygiene and tropical medicine also want to thank my other adivasi uh, youth team uh, subin and others uh, non adivasi members like john who also helped us translators uh, durga uh, big thanks to keystone foundation especially uh, anita vargis who mentored us uh, and the team for constant support uh, siddharth navindu uh, arun for guiding us with uh, helping us with scientific names uh, sharing their photos and and also uh, some of my friends who helped me uh, so with many ways during this project yeah so uh, that's the uh, that's a little presentation and uh, yeah now i'd like to open uh, for uh, discussion pv uh, over to you and you know take yes uh, it is so crisp and uh, you you stuck to the time perfectly <laughs> you timed it <laughs> to 40 minutes <laughs> and uh, we could we could amazingly uh, you know give the gist of the book a little bit of the gist because most of Uh, there are some students uh, who are in the in the in the meeting today there are some of uh, people who are interested in you know understanding of how you went about making this as a whole thing right when you when you looking at the field work and then uh, the flow and the process and the kind of uh, you know uh, the flow you followed uh, it was very interesting and crisp and uh, you opened up with a question also again um uh, not the with the with the challenges at the end how you went about and then some of the questions are still open uh, and uh, the book is still not in the print form uh, we soon expecting that to happen uh, so i will i i i would say like it's it's a very great effort like you mentioned 150 species were identified by some of the, the uh, 250 species were identified earlier and then you guys found 52 new species that's amazing uh, to know in the last 4 5 years of uh, your field work and then uh, you know and the involvement with the adivasi uh, children the, the kids the young uh, chaps amazing amazing to know it's it's so wonderful 
to know that Rajiv. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, open up to the questions. Uh, whoever has a question, please raise your hand, or you can type your questions. Rajiv can see it and then answer. If you have a question, maybe unmute yourself, uh, raise your hand and then unmute yourself, so then at least we know who's you know uh, asking the question, right? So over to you. Okay, Rajiv, uh, just uh, two questions. One is just for general knowledge. Uh, how they get uh, the patent uh, for a plant, say, for example, if something is native to our own country, right? Uh, suddenly, you no, know, uh, somebody gets a patent uh, from other countries. That is one, because we don't know much about this patenting of plants. And second, uh, there is a field called Siddha, right, in medicine. And that also based, that, that basis actually, you know, plants. So what's the difference between this Pachamandu and Siddha? Is it the same or it differs somewhere? Just two questions. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ramesh, for uh, that question. Two questions. First, yeah, how do, get, how do people get patents? Uh, so basically, scientists or whoever is working, they identify some chemical products or they make some discovery or some new discovery that they have done through their research and they apply for patent and there is... Uh, in India, the uh, there is uh, the government body which awards patent, but luckily um, uh, there's also the biodiversity board uh, which prevents, which is part of the UN um, uh, organization called World Intellectual Property Organization or simply called as WIPO. So they have uh, uh, thankfully uh, framed guidelines on preventing such commercial exploitation. Especially the biggest example is like Americ an American company had uh, patented. A chemical component of turmeric and it took i think nearly four years for the indian government to uh, fight it legally and get it back so uh, so after these such uh, so the wipo and um, such wipo and such uh, similar uh, organizations at international level and indian government have ensured the safeguarding of these intellectual property rights so so one of the work our aim was so when we document this as community knowledge uh, provide this information is provided by so and so from belonging to this community and registering so ensures it itself will ensure that patents cannot be um, you know uh, awarded if such knowledge is already reg uh, registered so that is one second question is yes um, i also have uh, worked with the siddha uh, earlier anthropological researcher was involving siddha uh, practitioners in tamil nadu so the only differentiation is uh, there is how we divide in India, the health systems is codified and non-codified and codified are those which have written records. For example, Ayurveda, Unani, Siddha, Saurikpa is the, uh, the Tibetan medicine. Um, uh, all of these are for, have been there for centuries and they have been written in written form. Whereas the non-codified form is all folk traditions like what this is, what are grandmothers or mothers practice in our kitchen, what we practice in our houses, which are not written. There's no written document for it, but it's passed from one generation to another just by sharing this knowledge and practicing at household. So there isn't much difference, but uh, this is one difference. There's also a theory that all of these uh, codified traditions, including Ayurveda, all have evolved from local health traditions. So over the centuries, um, so there is a researcher from Kerala called Girija who, uh, who researched at the Center for Development Studies at Trivandrum, who has made a very detailed historical documentation of how the classical uh, Indian health systems have evolved from such local health traditions. So over the time they became polished and uh, either with the influence of Sanskrit or, or um, for, the exam for example, in Siddha, the influence of writing these things in Tamil on palm leaf those days, so made it into a codified form, and therefore this knowledge has. Uh, so again, sharing from my own exam uh, field work uh, in Tamil Nadu from the Siddha healers. So for example, uh, a vitamin C supplement those days in the Western Ghats or the hilly regions was amla or gooseberry, what we know. But in the in the plains that we didn't get it, so there was a substitute for it, and that's how. The knowledge differed so they would find out what was the substitute near near closest substitute so there isn't really much of a difference between what uh, at an ideological level or a, uh, uh, the uh, principles of healing practices for example siddha says marande marande which means food is medicine medicine is food so uh, 
whereas ayurveda has a tridosha system of uh, uh, principles so i would say there isn't really much of a difference the only difference is at a at a face value which is codified and non codified i hope this answers your questions yeah perfect <laughs> and the last oh. one um, so i have read uh, somewhere you know the biggest disadvantage of the passing of this knowledge from uh, heredity from to only you know it's restricted to one of their family friends or somebody who stays always with them because in the core they were told you no know, it should not be passed to any other strangers and still are they uh, in that same mood or they are now open uh, to you know people like uh, an organization or individuals reaching out to share this knowledge yeah so uh, even in our field work we found a lot of them weren't ready to share because they felt that it's a family property uh, it's passed from one generation over the centuries and they can't share this information to others and even till day there are uh, ayurvedic families who have uh, practiced classical ayurveda who haven't gone to ayurveda college who have their uh, ayurveda practice passing from 45 to 60, 50 generations and they don't believe in um, sharing this and they strictly think that it only has to be Die, uh, give it passed on to their next progeny it's it's all we have and i have encountered similar instances even in the adivasis here uh, which is what i think we should respect how they see it and uh, and and you know let them decide what they want to do it and uh, the whole aim was if they are passing it it's well and good for those who are not able to pass it on for variety of reasons uh, even in the adivasis we found the youngsters are not interested to carry on this or for commercial or other development activities they're moving out to urban areas for work and they're not able to and so these were the people whom we were able to contact and they were also ready to share this yeah i think there is one question here from uh, dr jo joseph um, yes go ahead yeah. you can take the question rajesh yeah. how do you plan to carry forward the knowledge you gain so as to benefit wider population urban people and others wanting to benefit yeah one of the main aim of having this document bilingual and especially in english was for those urban uh, urban folk like me and you who don't have access uh, to read no to read and write tamil and that's why that's how uh, so that serves the purpose of having it in english uh, yeah how do we carry it forward so like i said you know field work is very difficult and working with the organization especially at a community level is very challenging uh one of the challenges now to take it back and disseminating this information back first and foremost with the adivasi community and see how uh we can take it forward in uh, my earlier work with the school children we have noticed that uh, they're more eager to learn take them on transit walks there is very uh, good interaction sharing and caring of knowledge happens very easily i found by practice that is one way of uh, uh sharing the information and continuing which is also what i pv and couple of others here in the audience have been doing with the bangalore tree festival network uh, reaching out to many people as much as possible through tree walks sharing this knowledge uh, and because so once this is in the public domain and that's the advantage of having it in register and putting it in public domain it is accessible to everybody and everybody are entitled to access this knowledge thank you uh, right thank you yeah one more question from shweta yeah um, Shweta, you can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, good evening, Rajiv. Uh, this is Dr. Shweta here from Bangalore. Um, congratulations! Uh, excellent work. Very happy to see that you've gone ahead and documented all these years and translated it into a book that can be really useful for those who are uh, interested in this uh, particular field of work. And I'm sure it'll have a significant public health. Uh, impact also so uh, one uh, aspect that i'd like to uh, uh, ask about is um, has there been any geographical indication tagging that's been done for the medicinal plants that you have mentioned about so i think uh, that in a way can uh, uh, you know prevent what happened with turmeric so yeah. if there is uh, yeah so uh, gi tagging so has that been done uh no so as far as my knowledge goes i don't think that is being done um again uh, i'm not sure if gi tagging will uh, apply to the medicinal plants 
uh, but again, I'm not sure. I need to find out, and uh, I will definitely look into it. Um, but what I had uh, understood from some of the colleagues at the Foundation for Revitalization of Local Health Traditions in Bangalore, who are part of the National Biodiversity Board, is with the medicinal plants is, and especially if the community themselves organize and document it and put it in public domain, that itself and register itself, it ensures the uh, ensures and safeguards uh, the intellectual property protection, which is equivalent to GI tagging it. So it's it's yeah. part of the intangible cultural heritage, and therefore it. But I will still go back and find out. Uh, I need to check this. Thanks for raising this yeah. question. And also, you brought about the public health component here. Uh, yeah. So one of the thing is when the public health component, when working with the communities to make sure that health reaches to their doorsteps, and one of the ways is uh, raising awareness about our own local health traditions. Like when people know about what plant is used for what primary uh, ailments, and you know, when us we all can become primary healthcare practitioners for ourselves for treating primary diseases like cold, cough, fever, instead of going getting a paracetamol and having small kitchen garden growing these things at our own home. This increases our autonomy of, of our own uh, cells over the health of us, our own health. So thereby, uh, it naturally improves our health status at a, at a grassroots level. So, uh, so that's, that's the advantage of uh, in linking this work to the public health. And that's where my public health background and working with uh, using a community health approach has been major uh, pull for me. As you're ask, answering that question, the next question also connected to that. You can answer. Yeah. With Malvika. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know how do you narrow the gap between Western medicine and traditional ecology? Yeah, it's a it's a big debate. <laughs> um, so my last uh, last five years of being working on this area, largely, uh, um, how do we see the bring the blur or uh, you know, remove the boxing or uh, siloed Western system and Indian system or Chinese system or Eastern system. I would say, even till date, a lot of the Western biomedicine drugs, 50% of them are plant-based. Homeopathy is so much plant-based. Uh, so, so in in principle, they are, there is actually not much of a, uh, there is, in principle, there is no dichotomy, you know, uh, all of it is either plant-based or animal-based drugs or some other like penicillinase-based or fun fungus. But at a practice level is what the problem is. Like in India, we see um, uh, all of the, uh, there is a hierarchy by the Western biomedicine over Indian systems of uh, practice. And they, the, in turn, the Indian system of practitioners like Ayurveda, Unani, Siddha practitioners have an hierarchy over the like, local health, the healers. So at a pro policy level, the policies that we have, uh, for example, the educational policies, these are pushing the local health traditional, uh, local he uh, traditional healers to the margin. And, but at a practice level, the legitimacy of their practice is still by the people who, who go to them and you know, they are still able to continue the practice because a lot of, them, of these treatments are successful. So, so for example, a uh, few years back, the Chinese, uh, uh, the Nobel uh, Physiology Medicine, uh, Nobel Prize for the Physiology was awarded to a Chinese lady who founded the chemical substance for treating uh, malaria. And that was so sort of artemisia, uh, a, a herb called artemisia, which is found across the Indian subcontinent. And people in the Adivasis in Orissa have been using it every monsoon, boil this leaves, drink the concoction every monsoon, uh, every night during the monsoon. So, so at a practice level, there is not much, but at a policy level, when you know, when it comes to commodifying this, that's when I think the divide becomes big and apparent, and all the other debate comes, uh, especially fr from a commercialization point of view, the drug industry. Yeah. Have you also realized that, um, uh, despite being a gap between the Western medicine and the traditional medicine? There is also the challenges of uh, maintaining the indigeneity uh, among globalization and urbanization. One challenge. Another challenge is how to pass on the tradition to the younger generations if there is a widespread migration from the forest to the 
uh, urban areas so how do you how do you think uh, uh, traditions are like uh, the econo- ecological knowledge is passed on to younger generation due to all these challenges uh, yeah how- yeah very tough question but over the years i think i have found few answers for it like in the photo i shared in the presentation uh, where subin is using the the tropical soda apple uh, to wipe his feet uh, use a juice to apply to his feet to ward off leeches and once we start having these practices regularly doing it and i think that's how traditions continue right? traditions meaning any such practices will will continue if we uh, divulge this information and like one of one of our effort is uh, part of this effort is uh, putting out these document uh, div- disseminating this information more and more conducting tree walks and therefore reaching out to more and more people it is a challenge to reach more people getting uh, so it's like having a popping a paracetamol tablet is so easy than going out finding out this herb sourcing it out grinding it then so bitter <laughs> so so acceptability is also quite so these are the challenges and 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 i think slowly over people following it more and more uh, is is the only way answer out yeah other question of yours was urbanization uh, it is a big challenge and now as you know uh, india is going through a tough time uh, the newer environmental ministry uh, uh, policies are quite detrimental to the biodiversity not just the fauna but also the fl- flora in many forests of uh, of, of uh, india so one way of conserving is a conserve building this conservation of biodiversity is by increasing such increasing the awareness and there that means we have to work more and more by uh, raising the awareness through multiple means yeah so that brings back to my question of challenges like how do we disseminate this information books solely reached will be reached by those who can read uh, but what about those illiterate what about those who can still read but cannot uh, access this book uh, even if we have audio video what about those people who cannot uh, listen or see this watch these videos so it's it's quite challenging and there's no one but one answer and i think from my experience as as i've been delving more and more some of the answers are coming and and i think we need to continue working on that to find out more and more answers excellent uh, i wish you the best thank you wonderful raju there is a very nice question from uh, shweta there so there's one question from devi vishnathan uh it's it's a long question i would say like because uh, when you said you recorded uh, audio video uh, does it include where these plants are is it uh, you know because the healers know where they grow which season they come up are people start commercially growing up are people losing those what is the situation right now i mean if somebody knows it's amazing the the soap uh, the, not the soap the apple thing that you mentioned for the you know the leeches if somebody start yeah. growing commercially will it grow everywhere are they yeah. losing <laughs> are yeah, people yes. losing it <laughs> yeah so so yes uh, so that's something called silviculture which means um, growing medicinal plant nurseries so that's a technical term and government is already doing it um, so silviculture farms are being increased and government now uh, it's a it's a good um, agriculture practice it has a lot of um, economic benefits so this is one of the recent trend in agriculture that uh that silvic culture where medicinal plant or aromatic plants have been in, in the government is encouraging farmers to grow them commercially that these are the plants which are safeguarded i'll give you one example um subin who told me about uh, during our walks uh, he told me about a plant called uh, maramanyal which simply means tree turmeric and he told that in his uh lifetime he has only seen it once and so it's it's like a turmeric it smells like i don't know uh, it it looks like turmeric golden yellow in color the stem when you cut it and it's it's uh, it's very highly valuable uh, valued in ayurvedic uh, medicine so a lot of the middlemen come and you know they they want these and they so in the last then i looked up and in, uh, in the for the conservation status the last 60 years the uh, availability of the maramanyal or tree turmeric had is as reduced by 80% by uh, mainly through inadvertent cutting and not many ways of propagating it back so uh, so that's a that's a potent threat and we had these conversations even according to gullur and uh, one example of how to overcome is a ke- example of kerala model 
the Kerala government has a, a, a body called Kirtad, which uh, it's an abbreviation. It stands for Kerala Institute of Tribal and Rural uh, Development or something. And it's headquartered in Calicut. And what they do is they have given passes or they've recognized healers, identified healers through gram panchayats and given them uh, ID cards. And these ID cards are used by these healers. They ac access the forest so they can procure non-timber non forest produce like medicinal plants. And they have also made an arrangement with the, the healers that, so they sell these for produce back to the, the kitard and avoiding middlemen, therefore also avoiding economic exploitation. So they get the market price back for their uh, work. And instead Kirtar processes it and sells it to big Ayurvedic uh, uh, houses like Kotakal and others. So which is a very good model. And these are one of such uh, sustainable examples and models that could be uh, used elsewhere. And, and uh, yeah, so one way of safeguarding is increasing more and more uh, usage either by silvic culture or such uh, models. Uh, but the continuation, not continuation, the other part is when you recorded those audio visuals, videos, did you also record they taking, collecting, bringing it and then safeguarding? Is yeah. there any process yeah. involved? Yeah, so yes, despite being do doing so much of work, I still honestly feel our reach has been very much superficial. Um, despite being using ethnographic tools to gain trust and you know that's how anthropological approach happens i still felt that we haven't been able to get into that level of they taking us in confidence there they would reveal how they would source how they would uh, procure prepare it some of the healers did share but we couldn't uh, document so much in detail uh, some of the reasons also because we were under uh, time constraint funding constraint uh, so these are also the challenges of of doing this work, and you know it requires a lot of time, dedication, being there, stationed there, and it takes years of um, uh, work to really uh, understand how it works. Yeah, so we didn't uh, we didn't we didn't document how we procure it and how it is prepared. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So the next uh, there's one question from Samuel John. Uh, Samuel, you can unmute yourself and ask. Sure, thanks, TV. Hey, Rajiv, how's it going? Uh, one wonderful talk. Uh, <laughs> I see your umbrella in the background. So, just very quickly, I want to, I mean, it's not as serious a question as the ones you've been asked so far, but I just wanted to understand if you have any anecdotes on the discovery process. Uh, because interestingly, you said, for example, Akhmela, uh, the toothache medicine, is again native to Brazil, I think. Brazil was generally South America. So is Lantana Kamara. Lantana Kamara came as recent as the late 1800s, if I'm not wrong, with the British. Um, Eryngium fetidum, which is also featured in the list, is also from South America. So you, you know, it sort of leads you to believe some of these discoveries are recent. So what is that discovery process? Do you have any anecdotes from them in terms of how they went out, how they found it, uh, when it sort of started outside of an oral tradition? Yeah, uh, yeah, for... Uh... For the benefit of others, so Sam uh, John, as I know him, was also one of my former colleagues at Goodlur. Um, we've also done a lot of uh, uh, transit walks and uh, being part of these uh, walks with the healers. Yeah, uh, yes. To answer this question, uh, the notable feature uh, in among the narratives and conversations has always been the lantana. Uh, lantana being the invasive species in particularly in the Mudumalai Tiger Reserve and uh, neighboring uh, Bandipur and Nagar Hole. Not so much elsewhere, but this has been like the major uh, invasive species uh, threatening the biodiversity of both the animals and the plant species. So people, we have, ident uh, like again, going back to Chemban, Chemban Tata had told me uh, showing from his uh, uh, house sitting over a hill cliff uh, overlooking a valley he told me that when he was a kid 60 years back, he said this was lush forest, there was no tea plantation. And now uh, over the 70s and 60, late 60s and 70s, it was replaced with tea plantation. And he said tea also came when his great grandparents were young. And so I think roughly around 18, 18 uh, 90, early 19th century when they started exploring these forests. So, so they know, they've identified these timelines by their uh, again orally by coincidence, I mean like linking it to their birth of their ancestors. 
uh, but lantana has been more invasive in the last 40 40 to 50 years again chemban tata i told now most of the teas the tea plantations have been re- taken over by lantana like a, he he literally mentioned this is like a devil species just taking over everything uh, it sucks up the it it holds the ground so firm that you pluck it so many times it comes back like anything um, you know um, uh, so it's so these are some of the anecdotes uh, which they could i think again others they haven't really been able to notice it because of the the uh, intensity or the magnitude of which these species have been there and i guess you know tea and uh, lantana being one of the so big uh, largest um, species that or they encounter on a day to day basis interestingly lantana although it is being so much invasive they use it for um, uh, oral diseases so the lantana twig is also used for uh, uh, just like neem twig to uh, maintain their oral hygiene to brush their teeth so this also has been again a recent uh, uh, discovery in their uh, in their lives um, rajesh there's a uh, question from rohit it's yeah. on the chat you can just read this and then uh, he he it's, it's a long question i was not able to interpret it better so i am asking you to read it and then answer yeah uh, okay doubt is the basic tenet of western medicine and rcts are intended to resolve that i get the feeling that faith is central tenet of traditional medicine and interventions in this systems have not been exposed to the rct type of scrutiny i may be wrong about this do you see a distrust between systems arising out of differences how can this yes yeah uh, thank you rohit um, if i'm not wrong this is rohit nayar uh, from iowa you know my friend um, yeah there's also the recent discussion that's that's happening in in present with corona virus and the vaccine trials and the ministry of ayush uh, promoting some some of the drugs uh, so yes uh, so hi rohit um the same rohit yes so how do we uh, this is a long debate uh, when i started working on this one of the first questions i as a western biomedicine trained person also had the same question like do we have to uh, so for the benefit of the audience rct means randomized clinical trials uh, so it's it's the method of scientific uh, research inquiry how drugs are tested um, uh, drugs are tested through four phases and uh, and uh, finally given the certificate that it could be uh, fit for using so drugs and vaccines and that's a biggest big debate that's now happening across mm-hmm. the world now how do we scrutinize so one of the um, the epistemological way of looking at this is uh, how i take it is if this has been working for centuries through trial and error and uh, and especially ayurveda also uh, for example ayurveda is a very scientifically scientific um, uh, scientific uh, uh, discipline so it 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 also has simply not taken drugs and um, herbs and source the uh, uh, the elements and use it so what we discovered that uh, for example the in, one of the indian schools of philosophy is the nyaya system which is very similar to the greek epistemology of uh, questioning a process so ayurveda very much relies on the nyaya system of um, inquiry of how systematically unraveling uh, uh, unraveling a question to answer their uh, to discover the answers for that question so having said that so ayurvedic Uh, textbooks and you know uh, schools of uh, schools have evolved over centuries using the uh, nyaya system and trial and error in general and for centuries if it has worked so it it means it works and and a lot of it is also for by trial and error with what i understand from a very lay perspective it, that was my initial but later when i start more learning more about it so for example ayurveda like i said uses the nyaya uh, system so so the current debate is that looking from the heg if i may put it in a very strong words hegemony of looking at from a western um, you know a scrutiny using not like a scrutiny but again sorry to use this word if we it's 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 so much by looking the whole world through only the lens of rct as a gold standard of fitting or certifying that this will work only if it goes us through goes through the four phase four phases of trial so so uh, our a lot of the healers a lot of the ayurvedic um, schools or indian system and even the tra- chinese system have been saying the same thing that 
if it has been working for generations it it works so we don't need to really go through again another um, certification process through uh, another lens but interestingly now uh, a lot of them yield to it to understand what element in these herbs are mainly contributing to this change so uh, it's still a debate ongoing debate uh, there's no answer but from me i feel i would look at that from a epistemological point of view uh, it works it has been working for generations and i think we should take it there and just go ahead thank you rajiv great presentation thank you yeah um, so paul uh, again from uh, denver uh, is asking this question um, what has been the most meaningful to you in this work and what are you most looking forward to next <laughs> yeah uh, i think uh, i have learned a lot and evolved as a person in uh, myself uh, doing this field work was the most challenging securing funds we got very small grant uh, we still managed to do it a lot of it was voluntary i'm eternally grateful to these botanists who who has so much encouraging uh, uh, like uh, one of the senior botanists is uh, r ganeshan or we all know him as rg uh, very senior person he was so uh, excited when i explained him this is the work and uh, although we couldn't really get his help but he was always uh, encouraging and meeting all these people i could connect uh, siddharth um, siddharth machado navendu pagi who is now assistant professor at wildlife institute of india and dehradun um, who is one of the very few taxonomists uh, uh, shared so much of information very welcoming and i think having these developing these connections not just with the the scientific and others but with the adivasis itself so so a lot of the times i was invited to their homes for lunch uh we would discuss so many other things um so so having developing these personal uh, bondage uh, bonds with these and having a community of my own friends and uh, who 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 all see me, i see them as family and they see uh, me as a family member has been i think a great um, learning process um and uh, the other thing is just evolving myself as a public health individual like how do we address and public health issue like this uh, oral health is so much neglected political issue in india and i have discovered that through my anthropological work very very slow means but now i feel like i have that strong base of foundation root grounded uh, grounded out understanding of where the root cause of these oral health inequalities and subsequently social inequalities are are arising from like like urbanization as a phenomena uh deforestation as a as a uh, as a effect are somewhere affecting oral health somewhere affecting all our health in direct and indirect ways so so all of these learning lessons have been uh, the most um, uh, rewarding experience what am i like looking forward to next continuing this work taking it forward um and i'm, I'm um, yeah so i've been uh, approached through sam uh, through john Uh, we plan to reproduce the same community led a uh, project in nagaland and andamans so so to replicate the same community based models and people could uh, document their own knowledge for themselves so as a trained public health dentist i don't know anything about botany i had learned a lot more about botany i learned a lot more about ethnography a, a lot more about anthropology during this so uh, i all all i did was being an anchor person connecting everything together and bring uh, uh, putting out everything together so i didn't really do much of a work but uh, as a technical person so most of it was like managerial administration work uh, but this has been like a very good resource now a lot uh, the I, the fact that people are approaching and wanting to replicate means that there has been some value to this work and and um, that's that's like what i see as like uh, value in the work that has been done yeah i think that's uh, nicely put in uh, uh, rajiv if if there are any one last question i have one question before that if there is anything you can ask uh, rajiv and then we can move on to closures any questions oh, i should ask or i'm i'm expecting no no i'm asking anybody to ask if there is any last question if they have <laughs> right okay so if no somebody is asking question If there's no question then i'll have uh, my question you mentioned about this lantana 
as a kid i used to eat those fruits and then we used to like take this flowers and then suck honey from there and recently like a couple of years back i read a full page article in hindu talking about that is a poisonous fruit and poisonous plant and all that what is your take on the the colorful lantana so yeah i have grown up in the suburbs of bangalore doing the same thing you did eating these fruits they are very sweet chewy uh, uh it attracts a lot of birds so again within lantana there are many subspecies and not all of them are invasive and only one or two varieties are quite invasive uh i don't think it's it's poisonous or it's detrimental so the challenge is again identifying and how do we address this issue from a ecological point of view to uh, curb the growth at a very invasive species yeah invasive rate uh, so there has been again at gullur there has been some work done on mapping how much of it uh, how much of lantana has taken the ground cover in bandipur and mudumalai tiger reserve it is nearly estimated it has taken over nearly 60% of its cover uh, forest cover that means it won't even allow grass to grow so there's no grass no uh, herbivorous animals so no herbivorous animals no carnivores like big cats big uh, leopard tiger so it it is definitely you know um breaking the food chain there so so we a lot of scientists lot of even the forest department is working around the clock addressing that issue i i hope we find some answers for that but at the same time lantern is also a very useful material to make cane furniture so there have been other ways of utilizing it like cutting them and utilizing it reusing for some other purposes also yeah yeah like you mentioned a uh, lot of birds come in we call it as kurvi param kurvi chedi yeah, yeah. so that's what we call it as kurvi param okay wonderful wonderful like some someone just joined i was like sharing um those who join late of course you can check the video full video on youtube it's going to be there um so if there is any other question um uh, any questions raju you have final note uh you yeah. can close yeah thank you thank you pv for giving me this great opportunity um, to uh, share my experiences it's a pleasure uh, thank you all for um, acknowledging my invite and coming a lot of my friends are here my family is here um, so it's great uh, yeah thanks <laughs> wonderful so uh, like uh, initially if you most of you uh, might know talam talam means space uh, it's a foundation uh stala stal whatever right so it's talam in tamil uh so the the opportunity uh, for talam also to showcase to celebrate to you know kind of create an opportunity for everybody to show their work uh what a fleet happened today with rajiv thanks rajiv to uh, you know accepting our offer to show this as a first step it's more like launching soft launching today uh so when are we getting this book we are all waiting and i've seen some comments people writing i want to own it i want to buy a copy of the book so all that maybe if you're creating a you know the uh, fundraising campaign or something like a pre order whatever right it not necessarily be a big book it can still be a, a cute book which we can hold in a hand and then um, refer to those you know those plants i'm sure most of you, you he, rajiv gave his email address uh, rajiv why don't you type it again if at all if somebody wanted to get in touch with you they can of course write to you uh, and uh, i mean uh, you can share some of the pages if at all if that is allowed and possible right so i i thank uh, all of you uh, for attending this session today it was wonderful hosting yet another interesting talam talks thanks rajiv thank you all uh, thank you. so that's the uh, end of the session so you might leave uh, the session rajiv please uh, be on the stage we'll just have one final 5 minute couple of minutes talk so i'm just stopping this recording